So on the previous section, we won't get started with this cyclone uh, topic just yet. I just want to cover this uh, design quick, where we consider the design of a separator, a centrifuge, to separate meat from meal. So this is a, a common uh, step in any food production, especially in uh, well, beverage production, I should say, where you've got the particles that you want to separate from the liquid. So orange juice, beer, there's many foods and, and beverages where this is a relevant topic. Uh, and in bio-separation, obviously, it would be a similar situation. Except here, with food production, the scales that we work at are much, much larger than the bio, bio scale. The key issue that we face, though, is that our density of the particles we're trying to separate, in this case the heat is 1075, is very close in density to the liquid that it's suspended in. So that very small density difference um, is, is what we're going to essentially play on to get the separation to work. Clearly, the need for centrifuges is because sedimentation or gravity separation is not going to be sufficient uh, to be doing this in a period of time. And also, in the case of beer separation, you want the, the separator to be closed. So the sedimentation vessel has the disadvantage that it's an open unit and aseptic operation is not possible. So a centrifuge that's closed up, uh, we can guarantee this aseptic condition down here. So, very close density difference. The other issue is that we've got yeast cells that range in diameter between 4 to 6 microns. So we have a particle size distribution of yeast cells between 4 and 6, which is the particle size distribution of particle size value, the diameter we'll use in our problem. Would we go for the average design value for 5 microns, or would we target the larger diameters or smaller diameters? Smaller diameters. And would you just go for four microns? So we could over design our unit and head for three microns, say. So that's a 25% over design factor based on the particle size. Head for three microns, maybe two and a half microns, and then that way we can be sure we'll get we we'll get all the yeast cells out. So again, we come down to what the specs are on our requirements. But it's clear that we'll be heading for the smaller particle size and not the larger particle size, because the larger ones will separate out faster anyway than the smaller ones. So what I'd like to do is let's go look back at our, at our equations that we looked at the centrifuges. So a few slides back, we looked uh, last class at scroll centrifuges, and then we looked at this whole centrifuges. But the one the one key equation that holds no matter what the centrifuge is this uh, sigma state. So for any type of centrifuge, we can always calculate the volumetric flow rate is equal to the velocity under Stokes' law for gravity multiplied by sigma. Sigma will change depending on the type of centrifuge. You get a different sigma for a tubular ball centrifuge than you would get a sigma for uh, so we saw the signal for the chicken ball centrifuge last class. We also saw it for this ball centrifuge, where we've got these angled plates. And the sigma equation for that um, type of centrifuge is a function of the plate angle, the radius and dimensions of the centrifuge, as well as the number of plates, and then the rotational speed angle. So what I'd like you to do is write down for this problem for the beer separator what we know, what we don't know, and what we're aiming to solve. So the knowns, unknowns, and really what is the objective okay. in terms of when I say that we know obviously we need to design the centrifuge, but what is it about the centrifuge we need to know? Okay. You're, you're in this situation where you're the, uh, an engineer in this food company, you're responsible for purchasing this engine. Uh, centrifuge. What are you going to ask the supplier when you phone them up to give you a quote? For? You're going to have to say, "I want a centrifuge with these characteristics." What is it? Those, what are those characteristics you're going to be asking for? In order to address this problem, you want to say. Yes. As you said, like the purity of the product, like if it's 
really important that you don't have any use and to what extent um, a piece will be out So is that a known or an unknown or a... Well, that's something that you would know. Probably. That's something In this case, know. yeah. I guess you could make an assumption to three or 3.5 or whatever. Okay, so we're going to make an assumption then that EP is equal to 3. Okay, so take a minute or two, uh, well, probably two, three minutes, talk with the person next to you, discuss what the characteristics are that you're looking for that centrifuge, and what, what, what information we're trying to find in this, in this problem. So the 
the entire centrifuge should be able to hold 100 meters cubed. For process. For process. Is that something that we should consider? Sounds reasonable? Yes? No? Yes. Yeah. 100 meters cubed, that's a huge amount. Of uh, so we're going to be spinning this large quantity of liquid around. So the question then is batch versus continuous. That uh, is where that should lead to. Right? Is this going to be a batch system or a continuous system? Yes. Continuous. So that means we don't need to be that big, right? So and that's that's the key uh, thing that you should take away from the reactor design course from 3K is that continuous systems are much much smaller than batch because uh, because of that that main advantage there. So definitely continuous. That's the first first thing we have to solve. What is the flow rate if we're going to continuously feed to this center? You know, when you're producing beer, isn't beer produced in a batch system? Okay, so there's a problem there. We've got this disconnect between the upstream, which is batch, and then here we now say we want a continuous centrifuge. So we're going to need a holding tank there in the middle to, to equalize it out. So we've got our batches uh, produced with beer. So there's one batch, and there's two. Second, third, and fourth batches of the day get produced. And then here's our centrifuge operating. And this is in batch, this is now in continuous feed queue. We need a holding tank here in the middle. So we're going to empty into the holding tank, and from the holding tank, we're going to continuously feed to the centrifuge. Once this batch is finished, I can then take that feed over to the next batch, and I can take it over to the next batch and start processing. So this holding tank is essentially a buffer that will empty up, this will fluctuate in level. I'll have a feedback control system on here, keep this at a, at a continual level. And so I can feed to that centrifuge on a continuous basis, Q. Okay, so a holding tank in the middle is important. What is that flow rate Q that I need? 400 meters Q per day. 400 meters Q per day. Sound, sound okay? Should I go less? I can't go less, but should I go so that the system can be more? You probably want to keep some time in the day for cleaning and maintenance and things like that, so you're on a pretty quick hours a day. Right, so your schedule might not be 24 hours a day, and you want some gap in there to, make, to do any maintenance work and so forth. So you might want to design the system to treat 600 or even 800 meters cubed a day. Uh, and your shift cycle in your plant might be that you only operate half a day, so, so you need to at least go double and maybe even more than that. So you might even be looking at a system capable of treating 1,000 meters cubed a day, just because of the way you operate. And that will also build in some room for future expansion in the company. So that's that. So they, these are some other side side uh, issues that we need to be considerate of when we're designing the system. So a higher flow rate Q than specified over here, smaller particle size than what we're actually targeting. Anything else that we're uh, uncertain of or don't know that we need to assume? Are we given all the information we need to solve this? What are, what are we missing? Um, I think we don't know the diameter or the rotation speed, and you need one of those to test together. Okay, so there seems to be more unknowns than unknowns. So let's come back to this. So essentially what Sarah's getting asking is, what is the centrifuge specs? What, what things do we need to ask our supplier for? when we're ordering a centrifuge. We need to tell them we want a centrifuge. They're going to say, well, how big? And what do we need to say? Like, what's the maximum rotational speed? That could be one of the specs that we asked them for. So what's the maximum rotational speed? Area. Size. Size. So specifically in our notation, we've been considering and that would be R1 and R2, the inner radius and the outer radius. Anything else? Number of plates n and, and the angle theta. Okay, so yeah, Mark. I was gonna say you can start to get those once you you take your size and you go to the choosing center fit um, central unit, and then a lot of those constraints will probably be. Okay, so uh, you're referring to this this slide or or back one? There's like a table. Yeah, right there. This one. Yeah. When you use your particle diameter, you can figure out which energy you should have. Right? 
Yeah, so this, uh, this will tell us which type of centrifuge, um, and then we need to then specify the geometry of the centrifuge yeah. from the... But a lot, like, I also assume that some of these centrifuges would have, like, a constraint. It's like, you know, it's been so fast. It's absolutely. Like, you start there, and a lot of those just fall into place. And you're absolutely right. So we've got, there's a lot of constraints that need to be uh, thought of. So here, up at the top of this slide, there's, there's some of that guidance there. The disc angle is between 35 and 50 degrees. So we know that theta, when we're asking for it, you wouldn't go ask your supplier for 60 degree angles. They'd say this is just not done in the industry, right? So we need to be asking for realistic equipment. So 35 to 50 degree angle place is realistic. Um, number of discs ranges between 50 to 100. R1 and R1 is obviously going to be smaller than R2, and R2 is typically between 15 centimeters and 1 meter. And R1 is going to obviously be smaller than R2. Omega max, 1200 RPM. Okay, so. So now we've got some bounds in with which to play, but still, as, as Sarah's pointed out, we've got more unknowns than knowns, right? We're not just solving for one thing, we're solving for five, five entries, right? So what we would typically do then is that the, any vendor for, for this is a fairly common over-the-shelf unit would simply give you a catalog and you go pick from a finite number of choices that they would make. And that catalog would then have a, a unit with this N with given thetas and R1, R2s, and, and a particular omega capacity. Two questions. Yes, would you? So, um, why are we picking a disc centrifuge? Oh, okay. You kind of glossed over that point. Why are we picking a disc ball centrifuge? Okay. Aseptic is vital. Aseptic considerations. It's a continuous centrifuge. Uh, so for those two reasons, this is, a, this is the most appropriate choice. Also, as you saw in the video last class, we don't have to stop and open this one up periodically. Whereas the, the tubular ball centrifuge, we've got solids accumulating, they accumulate, we have to stop, open it up, clean it out. There's an immediate opportunity for contamination over there. This one we can operate continuously and have the, the side piston open periodically and discharge the solids for us. So this is a makes makes more sense from that perspective. Um, just two questions. The R2 that's the day that's right, the radius. Uh, R2 is the radius. But those ranges are the diameter. Oh, okay, good point. So I had diameter there. So yeah, this would be divide two. Thank you. And just another question. Does R1 then have to be bigger than 0.15 over 2, or does it not matter? Yeah, so R1, oh, okay, I see now what's going on. In this particular diagram, R1 is, is the outer diameter, R2 is the inner diameter. So. Uh, Let's just switch this around. This is R1, and that's R2. Sorry about that. And, uh, R2 would be the uh, would obviously be smaller than, than R1. But then is there a limit on how small R2 is? Is that what is, does it have the same limit or not? Right. Oh, okay. So uh, no, there isn't there isn't uh, too much of it the detail, but obviously um, there would need to be. So if R1 is 15 centimeters, you'd need to have enough distance for the plates. And then maybe that would be about two, three centimeters. But again, this is where you start to iterate with the vendor and use their catalog or website to be specifying this. So no, I don't have a constraint on R1 here, uh, R2 on the slides, but the vendor likely will have constraints as well. Okay, so our approach is starting to seem one where we're just going to guess and check. We're going to guess values for these, which are within the bounds and then check. But what are we going to check? Right, so if I guess a certain omega within that bound, an R2, R1, N, and theta, or let's put it more realistically, I go to my vendor's website, I pick a centrifuge, find those five numbers, plug them in, what am I checking about it once I have that? What am I, how am I still going to verify that it, it, it will work or not work? You need to make sure that your throughput could exceed 400 meters cube per day. Okay, so with those settings, would I be able to get a throughput exceeding 400 meters cubed? That's one one check. Something else that you might want to check? 
Uh, you can probably calculate how much energy you'd be expending uh, around the centrifuge. Okay, so the energy consumption would be a, a number that you're interested in, but it's not going to be our limiting factor. Do you agree? Okay. <coughs> to make sure that all the particles are being removed. Okay. So if I specify those, uh, those five settings, would I be able to actually achieve this three micron particle size being removed? Okay, how are we going to verify that? We calculate the year. ETSV for those three micron particles. Okay. And then you have your you know your desired feed pass. So you basically have a single factor that you want to achieve. So calculate the VTSV for the three micron particle. And then you said and then if you you've already specified or you said this, you know, you specify our cube pass to eight hundred meters cube per day or whatever you want to say. Yeah, let's work with that number 800 meters cubed today. And then? And then you have to, your equation is like that times 30 equals sigma times So you just have to make sure that your sigma. So you choose, you, you know, this is not that. So you calculate your sigma from your specifications and then see if it. OK. There we go. Then we calculate the sigma from the specs. And what are we checking? We said this is going to be guess and check. We sigma from the specs to equal the sigma over here, or exceed it, or be smaller than it. Okay, so you want the sigma from the specs, let's call that sigma specs, to exceed sigma, let's call this sigma calculated. So I'm going to calculate my sigma over here, that's my unknown, and I'm going to buy a centrifuge that as long as the specified sigma exceeds the calculated sigma, that centrifuge will work. If the spec sigma I get is smaller, I need to change my specs to get it larger. So this is the, this here we've kind of discussed is an iterative approach to solve this problem. Okay. It's exactly how you would do it. There's too many unknowns that you cannot work backwards. You cannot work backwards from the theoretical sigma value and calculate these because there's five unknowns. Right. So we need to we need to uh, work in this iterative approach to solve these problems. Okay, and of course because this equation for sigma is a messy one, uh, we would do this in a spreadsheet. So here's here's one example of that. Let's take a look at this. Uh, Let's just unpack this here for a bit. So things in blue, I'll post the spreadsheet on the course website so you don't need to uh, reproduce it. So things in blue are given to us. So I specify my yeast, my beer density, um, liquid viscosity is assumed. Notice that point, uh, this, this was take water. Assume a particle size of three microns. Okay, and from that I can calculate the Stokes velocity in just per second. So this particle is moving very, very slowly. Uh, from the terminal setting velocity point of view. Let's specify the volumetric throughput. So we had said 800. Let's just uh, update that. So 800. And then 800 meters cubed a day translates into 0 0.009 meters cubed per second. So once I know my volumetric throughput Q, I can then calculate Q divided by the TSV and get sigma. So my calculated sigma is 34,300 meters squared. Guess and check, then let's, let's plug in a value for theta, 45 degree plates. Uh, let's assume 50 disks at the low end. Inner and outer radius specified, omega specified 4,500 RPMs. Um, so that's a fairly average little rotational speed, and that will get me a sigma of 34,600. So it will just, just exceed, that's calculated sigma will just exceed the theoretical sigma required. A little bit uncomfortable being so close to that. So uh, we should probably look at making that sigma calculated a little bit higher. Okay, so just to give us a bit of buffer room. We've already got a bit of buffer room, in fact, because I've used 
particle diameters of three, three microns rather than uh, a given four. So there's a buffer room in there from that fraction. Really. But perhaps you want just a little bit more. So then you can start playing with parameters. O n omega, I'm sorry, I should say n theta r1, r2, and omega. From a practical point of view, which one's the easiest to, to adjust? Omega. Omega. By far the most easy, easier one. So you could just investigate alternative speeds there. And the, the great thing about that similar equation is that omega is in there to the squared power. So small changes in the speed lead to large increases in signal. So even just a change up to 5,000 RPM uh, makes that a fairly substantial change in signal. Okay? Yeah. Because of that quadratic nature. So again, don't just plug into the equations. Actually look at it. That's, that squared power in the equation really is to our benefit. So we can get, for very small increases in speed, much, much greater separation. Yeah. Um, right there you have that sigma inspection greater than or equal to sigma calculated, right? Yeah. Well, sigma calculated there is greater than sigma spec. 34,000, that's the calculated sigma. He's okay. just saying that like you, you call it sigma calc over there, but the sigma calc here, sigma spec. Oh, I see. Okay. okay. Yeah, yeah. Different, uh, I set up a spreadsheet different to the board, right? Okay, okay. so I'll make the board one match my spreadsheet and I'll post the spreadsheet. Cool. Okay, so that's the approach to designing these units, and you'll start to see this um, more and more with, with separators, is that there's too many degrees of freedom for us to play with. Lock some of them down by specifying bounds that are within reasonable bounds, so when you go talk to your supplier, then you're talking sensible to them, and then um, solve for specs to make sure that you'll achieve our target. What is this checksum percent? Okay, so that was another constraint we needed. Uh, solid percent for, for these disk pulse centrifuges are typically 15% or less. They don't work well at very high solids concentration. So simply take the mass of yeast in there. Um, kilogram, we know the, the quantity of yeast and the density of it, so we can then check the, the percentage just to make sure we're in that, in that range. We can also check the number of Gs just to calculate if that's a reasonable value, and that's also typical. Really interesting when you go uh, use the spreadsheet is go to see what the effect of particle size is. So here we've chosen three microns. I suggest go change that just to 2.5 and 2 and see how dramatically the things change. So very small changes in your particle size distribution requirements lead to large differences in the type of centrifuge. Again, because particle diameter is limited to the power of 2. And so it's not a linear change. You get fairly strong change. Okay, so before wrapping up the centrifuge section, are there any questions on this topic? On this approach. So let's, uh, let's introduce cyclones next. So. operation you will see um, it's so easy to spot from when you're driving past a, a process on the side of the road. Almost every single plant refinery operation will have a cyclone somewhere. Guaranteed. Okay? It's one of the most common separators. It looks like this. So you've probably seen something that looks like that. It's got this, this uh, tapered bottom half and then a cylindrical <laughs> upper half feed, port, and then two exits at least. So the, the bottom exit and then the top exit. So entry on the side, exit at the top, which we call the overflow, and the exit at the bottom, which is the underflow. Okay, so here's my overflow leaving and my underflow leaving at the bottom. Okay. Uh, I mentioned at the start of the course the Dyson vacuum cleaner. So here's a Dyson home vacuum cleaner that I use to clean up drywall compound and all sorts of stuff around the house. 
There's six cyclones in here. One, two, three, four that you see on the top. So there's the four overflows and there's two more in here equally spread around. You can come look at this afterwards, but there's the overflows out here and the underflows come in here and that's what deposits the dirt. Okay, so the airstream coming in through the vacuum comes in here, the mixture of gas or fluid and solids gets spun around and we're going to see that the solids leave in the underflow and the overflow is hopefully mostly clean air. So the overflow gets pulled out here at the top, it then continues on through this filter which is uh, like the fine, will catch finer particles that weren't pulled out and then discharge the air through them. Yeah, so very simple principle of operation. No moving parts inside this section, right? So I can put my hand in here, it's perfectly safe. Okay, that's the great, great advantage of the cycle. No moving parts at all. Only the air stream coming in, or the, I should say fluid stream to be more, more exact, the fluid stream with the suspended solids comes in here. We'll, we'll take a look at these particle flow patterns, but there's a lot of spiraling motion. Solids leaving out in the underflow, and primarily um, the fluid stream leaving in the overflow. If, if our aim is to separate solids from the fluid. Okay, there's also situations where we're separating solids of different density from each other. So one solid mixed with another solid, typical in the mining industry. So gold and non-gold solids coming in will very quickly separate based on the density differences. Mm -hmm. What's the overflow? What is the overflow stream? Yeah. Overflow stream will be your stream that's, that's lighter. Okay, so in the fluid solid separation it will be primarily air with very, very small particles. Your larger particles will report to the water. Okay, so we'll see why that, why that occurs in a minute. So very, very common um, in many industries, dust removal is its primary use. And so that's for that reason alone, you'll see it uh, very commonly. Even in petrochemical, where you're not dealing with solids most of the time, but when it comes to catalyst particles, that's um, that's needed, and so, especially on circulating bed catalysts, there, there's that uh, component over there. For droplet removal from airstream, so very fine vapors, it's also used for smoke, uh, smoke abatement. It's also used for uh, areas where your, your odor, odor treatment, where your odor particles are suspended in some way in the airstream. So very common when you see solid fluid separations, there might also be an element related to odor, odor and odor treatments in there. Um, immiscible liquids is an interesting application. You can put two fluids of different density into the, into the, into the cyclone and they'll also separate out based on their density differences. It's used commonly to dewater suspension, so your, your water will primarily report to the overflow and your solids leaving at the bottom will be uh, dewatered. Dissolved gases from a liquid stream, and that's because there's uh, some changes in the, in the uh, pressures in the, in the cycle, which we'll consider. And then, as I said earlier on, very, very common in the mining industry for solid-solid separation. Okay, and so here's the guidance. If you're considering a centrifuge, Consider a cyclone first, and then if you cannot use a cyclone because it doesn't get you the desired efficiency, or because it's not a septic operation, um, or has some other characteristics that might be undesirable for you, then you can look at a centrifuge. Oh, sorry, not a septic operation, because a cyclone can be aseptic. So if, it's, if it doesn't have the capacity that a centrifuge uh, would get you. A centrifuge can get much, much greater uh, forces being developed. Um, which is why it would be an advantage of the cyclone, but consider a cyclone first primarily for the reason that there's no moving parts and it's a very, very cheap unit. So let's consider the principle of removing dust from air. Um, removing that is based on the fact that usually you want to stop the particle, the dust particles momentum, and allow the fluid to continue on. So there's a number of ways that one can do that. Right? The, a cyclone is one option, but there might be other options where you simply just use these, these vertical walls, which are called baffles, which will stop the solids particles from moving, the solids will drop out, and then the fluid will continue on and sequence them up <coughs> in that manner. Uh, some other approaches here, again, uh, the Perry's handbook is a great reference for this. 
a number of other options for removing solids from a, a, an airstream is by passing it through a region of liquid. So if you force an airstream with solid particles through the liquid, the liquid uh, particles will stop the, the dust. And there's all sorts of scrubbers that will do this for all manner of <coughs> geometries and shapes and configurations that will do this. So here we've got um, my gas coming in with solids, dust particles. I force it through a liquid bed, and then that vapor can bubble up or pass through that, that, that stream and then decouple itself and then the vapor stream clean from the solids now can, can leave there. The water will be cooled out and your solids get, get retained. Okay, so a number of geometries in this article on, on gas solid operations which is posted on the, on the course website and we have free access to that here at MAC. So please download this chapter from Aries and, and take a look at it for that aspect. Okay, but so my, my point here is that there's a number of alternatives to a cyclone, but uh, let's take a look now at how a cyclone operates. So no moving parts. What we do though is we feed in our solids on this tangential axis. So this is the top view. My solid vapor stream comes in here at a very high velocity and starts spinning around. So typical velocities are in the order of 10 to 30 meters per second. Coming in. Very high velocity of solid liquid, solid fluid I should say, and then I start rotating that around. What we'll see in the videos coming up next is that the velocity that you use here is going to be a strong factor of how well you separate your solids. Okay? And so one way we can control that velocity is by having a damper over here to accelerate those particles. So this damper control is going to be an important part of the operation of this cycle. Now, the path traveled by a particle in a cyclone is phenomenally complex, far too complex for us to model from a theoretical perspective. There's two spiral directions that occur in a cyclone, one clockwise and one anti-clockwise. So we've got our feet coming in, and that's rotating clockwise, and then we've got this updraft going in the opposite direction. Okay, so small particles the very fine particles will go, will enter, they'll rotate downwards, get to a point, and then they'll, the forces acting on that particle will actually pull it out and take it out the top. Heavier particles will rotate downwards and then just keep going. Okay, so smaller particles will keep going up and, and heavier particles down. So there's a cut size, a diameter which is going to specify the efficiency of this unit. Certain diameters will report to the bottom and smaller diameters at the top. Okay, so because this path is phenomenally complex, there's an interesting way, and we cannot model it from a theoretical perspective, there's a whole bunch of interesting simulations that one can go look at. So here's one I'm going to show you next, where the researchers have atta attached a radio isotope to a particle and then put it through a system where they can track that radio isotope. So the video is only three seconds of actual time, but translates into about three, four minutes of video. For three minutes of video, this is though three seconds in duration. So we won't go and watch the whole video, but you can see the particle entering here and, and heading towards the bottom. And it will actually oscillate. Sometimes it will go up and then it go down a bit, go all the way down to the bottom, and then it, it may eventually leave. Okay, so the path traveled by a particle is not just down a spiral and out, right? or down a spiral to the bottom and then back up again. It's not just one, one way. It can actually spend a, a number of a fairly long time in the cyclone moving around, depending on the balance of forces at play. Okay, we're going to take a look at the, at the, at the different velocities and forces acting on the cycle down there. How does a particle decide uh, on the, on if it goes to the bottom or does it go up and then exit to the, to the outlet? Okay, so yeah, we're going to look at the, the, the different forces at play and depending on the force that dominates on that particle is where it's going to report either in the underflow or the overflow. Okay, so that's just three seconds of operation. Um, Let's take a look back at 
the different forces going on here. So maybe before I do that, I'll just show, there's, there's a, a variety of videos here, but I, I would like to just take a look at one, one more that I kind of compiled up. So here's a simulation. Now let's just pause this for a minute. Because these units are so complex to model, we cannot do, create a theoretical model for it. Um, there's tons of researchers that do computational fluid dynamics, and they, they use all the Navier-Stokes equations, and they simulate the forces acting on these fluids, and then they create these simulation videos. So here's someone that's gone and created a video of a, of a, of a cyclone that's huge, 18 meters. It's almost the height of this room, okay? Four meters in diameter, and velocity of 10 meters per second coming in. And the particles range between 20 microns to 10 millimeters. And what they've done is, you'll always see this, they've simulated 34,600 particles. And they've chosen those 34,000 particles from that size range. So a uniform distribution or a normal distribution, I'm not sure, they haven't said. But let's take a look at what those 34,000 particles do the moment they enter the cycle. Now bear in mind that this simulation is a batch of 34,000 particles. Real cyclones are operating in continuous spaces. There's always new particles coming in and, and leaving. So we're just seeing one chunk of them, and they're, they're flowing through the cyclone. So red particles are larger in diameter. And notice here, there's this inner spiral that's happening. Okay, so let's just go back to that. So there's this inner spiral, and that those are the smaller particles. They get taken out at the top. Now, one thing about these simulations is they always keep all the all the particles present. In reality, those small particles will just keep going up and out the exit points. For the simulation purposes, they just keep them at the top, and they just keep them spinning around it. But essentially, that. Those are the small particles that have separate in the inner vortex. The larger particles uh, with red colors and darker blue colors are the ones leaving at the bottom. So then what the simulations will also do is they then say, well, let's follow a particle through and just draw its trajectory. So these are particles of small diameter. These are the trajectory they followed. They went down, and then notice that inner spiral in the inside and then they leave out at the top. So these are the small under 20 micron particles. The larger over 50 micron particles, they rotate around and then simply leave out the top. So that's the trajectory followed by large particles versus small particles. Okay, so let's understand why those trajectories are being followed. <coughs> Inside the cyclone, there's three types of velocities occurring. So now we have to start thinking in 3D here. There's a velocity the easiest one to perhaps understand is the velocity, what's called the tangential velocity. So this is the velocity of a particle around the circumference. And it's by far the greatest component of the, velo of the three velocities in terms of magnitude. So particles will come in at 10 meters per second, and they'll actually get faster and faster and reach speeds of, of 30, 40 meters per second in the tangential direction. According to that formula, the tangential velocity multiplied by the radius to the power n is some constant. Okay? So that means at small radiuses, the velocity is high, and at large radiuses from the outside, that velocity is lower. So what you'll notice if we plot the velocity at the walls will be a lower velocity in the tangential direction. So these velocities rotating around the outer edge will be rotating at a slow velocity Particles near the inner core actually rotate much faster than the tangential components. There's also a radial component. This is the velocity that a particle simply moves from the wall to the center. So this is a, simply in the radial direction. At, there's a, it actually goes that the particles will move faster and then slow down as they get to the middle, indicating that there's a pull into the uh, center. So these particles are flowing fast, then they slow, it, slow down to that inner vortex in the radial direction. But that's a very small velocity on a magnitudinal basis. Then there's the up-down velocity, what we call the axial velocity. So in the axis of this uh, cyclone, there's velocities up and down as well. 
and the velocity components are such that the inner core has a very fast velocity up, so it's a very large value, and then there's this velocity in the downward direction. So we need a sign, so velocities in the upper direction are positive, velocities in the downward direction are negative. There, the velocities at the wall of the cyclone are, are negative, i.e. in the downwards direction. Indicate that particles along the wall are rotating very fast in a tangential motion, but also rotating down and spiraling out. So down and circularly and radially, all these velocities are occurring simultaneously. The balance of those forces on the particle are what determine whether it goes out at the top or the bottom. And then there's also what's called the LZGV. That's essentially the locus of zero velocity for vertical velocity because particles along this hypothetical boundary are actually not traveling neither up nor down. They're actually just suspended and spiraling at that, that vertical up and down point. Okay? So this is why it's so complex. And we cannot predict what's going on in the cyclone from the first principle perspective. Now here's the key issue or the key understanding we must have. It's not gravity that's pulling those large particles out of the bottom. Okay? It's simply the fact that the velocity at the boundary layer of the wall is much, much slower. And those particles just they go, go to the wall and they, they accumulate and they drop out. Okay? It's the slow velocity against relative that's uh, causing those particles to separate. And you can absolutely prove this to yourself. That vacuum cleaner, um, I've taken you, you hold it upside down, and it will work just as well as you hold it the right way up. So set, uh, centrifuges as well as cyclones are operated in any direction that you want, upside down or, or otherwise. Okay, so it's not gravity that's pulling out heavy air particles. The only case that that's kind of untrue is for very, very large cyclones where the velocities are slower. Okay, then gravity may play a role, and those we will orient but by and large, the smaller cyclones you can operate any way you like, which is actually really um, beneficial. In some situations, it may be easier to mount the cyclone horizontally rather than vertically. So if you're running out of space in a plant, you don't need that constraint. Um, and that's, a, that's an interesting benefit. Okay, so particles will rotate and find this balance of centrifugal force. Remember, the centrifugal force is induced by that tangential velocity. Let's come back to that. Tangential velocity is this velocity on the outer ring. It's um, very, very slow at the wall, relatively speaking, and then the tangential velocity component gets higher and higher. So that's indicating also where the centrifugal forces are. The centrifugal force is induced by the tangential velocity. So the force on the particle is much greater here on, on, on a, from the perspective of the centrifugal force relative to the wall. So what will happen is you can appreciate, and you saw from that video of the radioactive particle, that at some, there can be regions in the cyclone where those forces balance each other just perfectly, and that particle will simply just rotate around and around and around. Okay, and we, we like to get to that point because we need a resonance time in there to get this equilibrium to set, let the particles either choose to come out at the bottom or at the top. So what we're going to do in the next class is we're going to recap this and then we're going to look at how we can judge the performance of the cycle and how we can alter it.